This episode may contain sensitive language not suitable for children. Welcome back to Season 2 of Three Black Eyes Unfiltered, the podcast that brings truth to light. Listen to present-day historical events that shaped our history and will determine our future. It's presented by moderator Raymond Dunn and expert Marvin Dunn. I am Dr. Marvin Dunn. I'm the author of several books dealing with black history in Florida. The first book was on the Miami Riot of 1980, Crossing the Bounds. It was written by myself and Bruce Porter. I've also written Black Miami in the 20th Century, and it deals with the history of lynching in Florida. And my latest book is called A History of Florida Through Black Eyes, and it traces the history of blacks in Florida from the arrival of black people with the Spanish. These books are available on Amazon. Welcome to Through Black Eyes Unfiltered. I'm Dr. Raymond Dunn, your moderator, and... I'm Dr. Marvin Dunn, your historian for this broadcast. In this episode, we will discuss white supremacy. Our guest, Dr. Heidi Berich, is from the Southern Poverty Law Center, and she will help us out in trying to understand what this is all about. Dr. Rich is an expert on various forms of extremism, including white supremacy, She's an expert on neo-Confederate movements and such. She's an expert on racism in academia. She oversees the center's yearly count of the nation's hate and and hardline anti-government groups. So we're depending on her to share with us a wealth of knowledge about how these things work, why they happen, and what can be done about them. So I'm going to ask Dr. Marvin Dunn if he would uh, ask her a few questions that will get us started. Thank you again for doing this. I'm a black historian. I do uh, a lot of uh, historical work on racial violence in Florida. Tell us first a little bit about the the Southern Poverty Law Center and how you became associated with it. Sure. So the Southern Poverty Law Center was founded in 1971 um, really as a legal organization to try to take the civil rights laws that were passed in the 1960s and make them a reality. You know, in the 1970s in Montgomery, Alabama, there was still segregation, even though we passed, you know, the Civil Rights Act and Mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. So the law center did things like sue the YMCA so that black children could swim in the pools. They sued the state troopers, the state legislature, all kinds of things to try to move closer to um, an equal situation in places that have just been ravaged by segregation and Jim Crow. But over time, the law center started doing things like tracking Ku Klux Klan groups. We began to sue white supremacist organizations in civil court to put them out of business. Oh, yes. Then, I wanted you to talk about that a little bit. You, you folks made a very, very big splash in that, in, in that effort. So tell us a little bit about what happened there with the suit against the Klan. Yeah, sure. So the actually the department that I work in is called the Intelligence Project and we produce the list of hate groups and so on. Mm-hmm. And the origin of that department actually goes back to a lawsuit in the early 1980s where we sued um, a particular Klan group, the United Klans of America, because it's, their members were involved in what's often talked about in the United States as the, as the last lynching. Mm-hmm. A young uh, black man was lynched in downtown Mobile and we sued the group to put them out of business for that kind of violence. Oh, and and who, 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 who was the, uh, pl- the plaintiff in the case, Heidi? Yeah, Michael Donald. Um, mm-hmm. Some people will probably know him. And we sued on behalf of his mother, Beulah Mae Donald. So she was the person we were representing in the, in the case, an incredibly gracious woman. Um, kind of, kind of courageous, claims, too, I would say, wouldn't you? That was a courageous thing to do, right? It was extremely courageous. You're taking on the Klan, right, in the Deep South that has just committed this horrific act of violence to your son, right? And you're standing up to them, right? You're right there in Mobile, Alabama, saying no. Unbelievable. And doing something. Un- unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, so, she was, she's an amazing, amazing woman. So what happened? Um, how, that, how, how, yeah, go ahead. How, how did that evolve, the, the case? Yeah, so what happened during the case, well, first of all, we won the case. Mm-hmm. We won a, a pretty substantial multi-million dollar um, judgment. What the law center was able to do was to take the assets. They didn't have millions. The Klan didn't have millions of dollars of assets, but actually had buildings back then 
like in downtown Tuscaloosa, as though it was like the Elks Club or something. It's really outrageous. And we were able to seize those properties, liquidate them, and give the proceeds to Beulah Mae Donald. She actually used the money for to buy her first home. Uh, so this is in the early 1980s. And I just want to say that Klan group was so dangerous. It's the same Klan group that was involved in the uh, church bombing in Birmingham. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. same Klan group. Same Klan group that was involved in most of the violence in the civil rights um, era, you know, for people who were trying to get voting rights. And these these people are killers. How do you, how do you so, know that it, was, that it was the same group? Uh, it literally, that organization was literally incorporated as like an institution under the same body going all the way back to the 1950s. So it was exactly the same organization for okay. decades. That different leadership, mm-hmm. obviously the same horrific, awful mission. Mm-hmm. Uh, how um, do, how do, as you get into that kind of a group, are you able to identify the individuals who actually committed those crimes? Well, in this case, in this gruesome situation in Mobile, um, the the two men who were involved in the lynching, the members of the Klan group, were actually arrested and prosecuted for it. So the criminal court system did its work to find the perpetrators and prosecute them. And then what we did is we sued in civil court to take their assets. We wanted oh, to shut okay. the group down for good. And actually one of the um, people who was involved in the lynching uh, actually testified for us against his Klan group. Why did he do um, that? He had this realization that what he had done was horrible, right? He had some kind of moment. And, 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 and honestly, there, there are a lot of books about this trial. If you read into them, there's some powerful things that happened in the courtroom. This guy's name was Tiger Knowles. And he took the stand on our on SPLC's behalf against the Klan and, you know, confessed what happened and apologized. And there's this very powerful moment when Beulah Mae Donald forgives him in the courtroom. I remember seeing For what that. he's done. It's really something. So anyhow, our work today against all these different types of hate groups actually comes from that case because as they were doing the lawsuit, um, they realized, the lawyers at the SPLC realized that there was no list of where Klan groups were functioning in the United States. Like the government didn't produce something like that. There was no organization that could just tell people okay, this Klan group is in this location doing, you know, such and such. And so we compiled our first list of hate groups. It was narrow. It was only Klan groups then, starting in the late 1980s. So my department's origins go back to that very important case. But we've we've sued other Klan groups. We sued the Christian Knights in in South Carolina. We sued the Imperial Klans of America in Kentucky. We've had a series of these lawsuits over the years. And how how, how did those cases turn out? We have won every case. The judgments vary. I think, yeah, the Christian Knights case in South Carolina had a huge judgment of like $38 million. We just sued um, a group called Daily Stormer, a neo-Nazi group, and got a judgment just in the last I think, month and a half or so. We sued on the behalf of a Jewish woman that they were harassing her and her son and got a $14 million judgment. So we've had a lot of success in these cases. And the fallout usually is, is that the organization does not survive, right, the lawsuit. They are bankrupt and, and gone, which is good. That's just absolutely fantastic that the, uh, that the group has accomplished those things. Wh- what groups are you looking at, <clears throat> looking at right now? Who do you see as on the horizon that ought to be watched by, by your group and, and others? Well, you know, the landscape of hate is very different today than it was, say, even 10 years ago. And that's because of the rise of the web, right, the Internet. Um, nowadays, you know, it used to be in the 1990s, early 2000s, you had organizations and people were like card carrying members of some horrible hate group. And today, the fact of the matter is, is that the web has allowed a uh, racist, anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant, every form of hate and bigotry propagate to just spread everywhere. Mm-hmm. So we're dealing with a situation where the population is even more radicalized, in particular young white men than has ever been seen before. I mean, there are some hate forums that can have like a million members on them who, uh, you know, believe every horrific thing you can think of. And given our political climate and what's been happening with the president and and his kind of comments, this is a, it's a very scary time. The hate movement, we have more hate groups than ever. We have over a thousand. We hit our high last year with 1,020 of all the years we've been counting them. And, uh, and on top of it, we've got this web radicalization going on. 
Now, hold on so just one second, Heidi. Ray is going to reintroduce you so folks will know okay. whose voice they're hearing. And please pick up on okay. that in just a moment. Go ahead, Ray. Yes, I would love to just reintroduce uh, Heidi. She's our guest today. Uh, Heidi is an expert on various forms of extremism. Uh, she um, works at the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center and is in charge of most of the uh, work there that tracks the movements of all sorts of hate groups and racist uh, organizations. She oversees the center's yearly count of the nation's hate and hardline anti-government groups. She's really, really doing a great job. The center has done a lot in, in, um, in suing organizations and having them to pay for the horrific things that they've done. Uh, Dr. Berich is uh, a leader uh, in that uh, aspect of uh, racism and, and uh, anti-government terrorism. Okay. All right. Uh, if, if you would, Heidi, tell us a little bit about um, where the money comes from for you guys to do what you do. The Law Center takes no government money, I should say that, straight up. Mm -hmm. The bulk of our funding comes from, it depends at any point in time, but, you know, about 300,000 individuals who choose to give to us. Mm -hmm. So most of it comes from regular people. We get between 5 and 10%. I, I haven't looked at the numbers in the last, you know, several months from foundations, but mostly it's just from regular people who are giving us this money to, um, you know, sue hate groups, fight hate and extremism. And we have a lot of legal programs for, you know, juvenile justice reform, criminal justice reform. So it's just like regular people, right, who um, decide to support our work. So someone who's listening to your voice right now who wants to help, wants to make a donation, how, how would they do that, Heidi? Oh, well, if you go onto our website at, it's SPL Center, all one word, dot org. you can see their, you know, descriptions of all these programs and um, also ways to support the work financially. If you're just interested to get on our email list and get more information. Okay. I just want to get back to uh, your reference to the president and the, the, the racial climate in the country today. Do, do you have any way of knowing quantitatively whether or not there's been any increase in white superiority uh, groups and activities since the president became president? There are certain points of data that I would point to that I think shows that racism or racist beliefs are more widespread. I should say basically all kinds of forms of bigoted and hateful ideas are more widespread than they were, say, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. First of all, some hate, hate sites, websites, have seen their traffic explode in the Trump era. So there, there's a website called the Daily Stormer, for example, was launched in 2013. Almost no one read it until Trump came down those escalators uh, at Trump Tower in 2015 and announced his candidacy. And within a year, they had about half a million people a month reading that website. That number has grown since then. Thank you for making so there that are indicators, point. Yeah, there's indicators like that. But there is also survey data that shows that the number of people who now believe negative things about people of color have, have gone up. I'll just give you one specific data point. There was a ABC Washington Post poll about 18 months ago, and one of the questions they asked was, is it okay for you or your friends or neighbors to have either white supremacist or neo-Nazi beliefs? That poll the response rate was about 10% of the people who answered said that was just fine, which is shocking on its own. But that 10%, if you extrapolate it out to the U.S. population, that's 20-some mm -hmm. million people mm -hmm. who believe these things. Well, let me, and those numbers are really high compared to past era. Well, let me ask you a devil's advocate question. What about the folks who would say, listen, I, I, I admit to being a racist. I believe that black people are inferior to white people. But that's my right to believe that. I'm not advocating violence, but I have a right to be a racist in America. This is a free country. What do you say to that? Well, I mean, that's unacceptable. <laughs> it's, it's, those are exactly the beliefs, right? Okay, you're not committing an act of violence, but mm -hmm. you are perpetrating a way of thinking that is going to ultimately either encourage other people who might act violently on those ideas or to bolster discriminatory policies throughout the system, whether okay, it's criminal justice let, system. Let, let me stay with you on this because I know there are other voices who, who would be arguing this. I'm not asking anyone. I can't, I'm not responsible for what other people do with my beliefs. I'm just saying I'm not going to hurt anybody, but I have a right to not like black people, and black people have a right to not like me. Uh, it's, you, hard, you it's, are, it's hard in a free society to square that, right? 
look, everybody has the right to their beliefs, and we have the First Amendment, right? Mm -hmm. But these beliefs are not innocuous. They carry a price. And unfortunately, in this country, the price seems to always be borne by people of color. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I find something like that offensive and naive, mm -hmm. and of course, a very limited sort of human capacity, right, to be, to be believing those things. And those exact ideas are the ones that have to get fought against. And even though you may think when you express racist ideas mm -hmm. that it has no impact, it does. These things spread virally, and eventually they touch someone who might do something really awful, either in a policy realm, deny somebody employment, mm -hmm. deny somebody housing, or in the worst case scenario, we end up with a situation like the Dylan Roof shooting in Charleston, right, where nine people are killed, you know, per quiet parishioners in a black church. Right. So, and, and I would say also, it's even worse when you have the president of the United States. Just the words out of my mouth. I was going to go straight there, but please go ahead and make your point. Yeah. It's well, okay. because he is signaling and giving cover to some of the worst ideas humanity has created. Right. These thoughts about people, um, whether it's African-Americans, it's Jews, these are the kinds of things that lead to genocide. Right. And so this is not a laughing matter. And, and anybody who's going to be that cavalier about expressing those ideas needs to be denounced. Uh, Heidi, I, I would like to, to ask, uh, is the browning of America the greatest of the fears that uh, white supremacists are facing? And if so, what do they think that they can do about the browning of America? Well, I would say the biggest thing, you know, the web is like a tactic and a way to spread more messaging. Mm -hmm. But the fear that's being played on is exactly what you're talking about, the browning of America, right? Increasing diversity and multiculturalism. I mean, look, here are the facts. Sometime in the 20, 2045, somewhere in there, white people will not be the majority in this country. We will be a population that has a whole bunch of significant minorities. And there are a lot of white people who have cultural anxieties over this who are being attracted to more extreme ideas. And there are a lot of white supremacists who are terrified of that day coming and want to do anything that they can to stop it. Many of them felt that Donald Trump was going to save them from this change. But they're starting to lose heart, right? And, and that's leading to a whole lot of violence. So we had the El Paso attack which was directed specifically at immigrants, right? And, and the guy wrote a manifesto in which he complained about how these immigrants are taking over and they're, you know, they're displacing white people. You hear this a lot in the white supremacist movement, right? We're victims of genocide. We're being pushed out of our own country. Mm -hmm. um, the guy who killed all those people in the synagogue in Pittsburgh, he wasn't just targeting Jews. He actually went there because he believed that this Jewish organization that was hosted there was bringing in immigrants to replace white people. And this is an international problem. This is just an American problem. The guy who shot up all those people, 50-some people in mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, not that long ago, he also believed these ideas that white people are being genocided. So it's really – it's the demographic transition that is happening all across the Western world and which is, going, is inevitable that is heightening these fears and leading to more um, terrorism. In, of this kind. And basically what you're seeing is uh, this phenomenon is in white males, not just in our country, but in other nations as well right now. That's why the increase in white extremism seems to be growing. That's right. It is, it is absolutely a problem of young white men. And in fact, we have had some white supremacists killing, not, you know, not everybody keeps up on this like I do. But some scary situations where we have very young males, I'm talking, you know, 17, 18, 19, um, and, and some groups, there's just one group called the Ottawa Office Division, a neo-Nazi group, that we have been able to look at some of their chat logs. And there are kids, young white, they're kids actually, they're like 12, 13, 14-year-old boys, white boys, who are getting sucked into this stuff. So it's, it's like a specific problem of itself, the radicalization of young white boys and men. Mm -hmm. uh, Heidi, and that, that point right there is one that I would like for us to explore a little further because, you know, we see the white male as the aggressor here. The white male is the one out front doing the shooting. The white male is the one out front saying Jews will not replace us, marching up and down. But look at what is happening in the home. What is the white female doing? All, all of these uh, males with the racist views, they live someplace. They have wives. They have girlfriends. They have mothers. They have children. My, my, uh, my question is, 
who who's molding the the youth of those people? Because as long as 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 you have uh, white mothers who are not out there marching in, in many cases, but they 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 have the same beliefs and they're instilling these beliefs in the children. I don't know, bro. I see a lot of mothers. I see some white mothers out there too. I, I, I'm sure Heidi's right about the male, the white males being this, the uh, major perpetrators of, of this view. But I've seen women on television rooting for Trump and responding in the most incredibly horrible ways to some of the some of the things that the president says. I'm, I wouldn't let white women off the hook too quickly here. No, the, the, uh, the, one of the reasons I, I, I make this point is because in, in one of your books. You have a picture of someone who was lynched, and there are children there standing there with, I think, clan attire on. And it's, it's like it's like the, the the mothers, the women are there. My my point is, white men may be out there raising hell, shooting people, and and and, and shouting all of this stuff. But this stuff could not continue to go on if it was not being ingrained in the youth. And to me, that must be taking place at home and not just by the male. So is anyone looking at that? You know, you bring up a point that really is no answer to right now. And and what, why I say that is that there is so little information and research on how these processes happen. There has been such a neglect really at the highest level to even consider that it's a white population that is the problem here, right? And I would argue this goes deep into our history and our racism, right? It's a lot easier to think, oh, it's Muslims who are coming from somewhere else who are committing these acts of mass violence or to fall back on stereotypes of, of people of color and crime and so on. But there's an aversion, and this comes from this country's racist legacy. I mean, there's no way around it to really look at the dynamics that you're talking about. We know almost nothing about how it is that these kids get sucked into this. We don't know about the family dynamics. We don't know about how the web works. We don't know why one person ends up committing violence and another person doesn't. This society has basically chosen to, I don't even know how to explain this, almost like have amnesia or close its eyes to this phenomenon. It's one of the things that I have been railing about for, I don't know, 10 years now um, that we have to look at this. And we don't know. We don't know a damn thing. We have a little bit of information coming from people like Bill and Roof who write manifestos about how they got radicalized. You know, in his case, he, you know, he spent like 18 months in his bedroom all through Google, going through Google searches that led him down all this kind of hate stuff. He had a kind of broken family. Heine, we Heine, don't know that r- much. R- remind folks who he was, is rather. Oh, I'm sorry. Dylan Roof was um, the perpetrator of the mass attack in, at the Mother Emanuel Church in uh, Charleston, South Carolina in 2015. I- I'm just using him as like an example, and I'm trying to explain, trying to understand what happened to him. And all I've got is his manifesto, right? So a racist killer's description of his past. That's not so good. We need a whole lot of information. And I'll tell you that at the Southern Poverty Law Center, we have been considering funding pilot programs where academics who work with you will look at this problem, right? Try to figure out what the heck is going on there and try to figure out interventions to stop it because it's just a blank space in research. We just don't know anything. Thank you, Heidi. Let, let me take a moment and reintroduce you. Uh, this is Dr. Heidi Brich, who is the uh, Intelligence Project Director at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Where are you based, Heidi? Uh, where are you based out of? Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center's headquarters are in Montgomery, Alabama. That's where I am right now. But we have offices in a lot of southern states. We have an office in New Orleans, Tallahassee, Miami, Jackson, Mississippi, and Atlanta, Georgia as well. Okay. And tell us a little bit about your connection with the uh, lynching monument there in Montgomery. And then we'll let you go. We've so, proposed on you long enough, but yeah. tell us a little bit about that, please. Uh, no, I, I very much enjoy this. So the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, which is also located in Montgomery, Alabama, and, and run by um, a very well-known, yeah, you know, just, incredible death penalty lawyer, Brian Stevenson. People should, you know, Google him. There's great speeches um, on YouTube that he's given. And TED Talks are amazing. So um, the Equal Justice Initiative, which is an organization that we have helped fund over the years, recently opened a memorial. Two things, actually. They opened a lynching memorial where every lynching, the location of every lynching is marked and shown. So I would very much encourage people to go there. You go to the monument, you walk through there, 
and you, it, you know, a lot of people are just unaware of how many people were killed in this way in kind of mass white mob violence, right? Attacking largely black people. The, the bulk of them are black people who were killed. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a very powerful experience. And this country, the weird thing about this country, we have 1700 plus markers to the civil war, right? Celebrating white supremacy. And we have almost nothing to the victims of our white supremacist history from our founding until, you know, very recently. Mm -hmm. So EJI's project there is very worth seeing. They also have a museum um, that is very interesting. And then we have at the Southern Poverty Law Center Civil Rights Memorial Center that is dedicated to people who lost their lives in the voting rights battle and the battle to end segregation. I would encourage people who um, are interested in civil rights history, which I think should be every single American, to come here. This is, of course, also the place where um, the Selma to Montgomery March ended, right? And where Dr. King's uh, church that he preached, Dr. Baptist Church is here. So it's a very powerful experience in a way to to really come to understand, I think, the civil rights have been what it meant for all Americans and for equality, not just in the U.S., around the world. You know, coming to Montgomery is a powerful place. And the memorial that EJI did is a very important piece of that. Yes, I visited it once and was absolutely uh, overwhelmed with, uh, with, with, with the memorial. I, I, want, I want to mention, though, that um, as a part of the exhibit, they have a series of jars hundreds of them, which contain earth from places that have been identified as to where a lynching took place. And it's just it's right. it's, it's very moving to walk up and walk, walk along that wall of, of mason jars of dirt from around the country. I think they brilliantly have displayed something to talk about one of the most tragic parts of our history. I mean, I think it's almost, it's almost a requirement to go there. And I should mention there's also a wonderful Rosa Parks, um, museum here as well that's right at the location where she uh, decided she'd had it with those segregated buses, right? Montgomery has a storied history of civil rights. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, anything else we want to touch on before we, uh, we we let Heidi go, Ray? What, what do you think? Well, I certainly uh, enjoy talking with you. One of the other things, if you have time just to make a couple of comments about it, is uh, I believe that your organization does training for lawyers across the country. Is that right? So that you can uh, spread this effort out a little bit? Yeah, we have we have a whole bunch of programs along those lines, trainings for lawyers, events where you can get education credits. There's there's a whole series of things, that I, and I've spoken almost nothing about our larger program besides the hate cases, mm -hmm. But and I am not a lawyer, right? I have a PhD in political science, but I'm not a lawyer. So I would encourage people who are interested in those things to go on to that website at sgillcenter.org and have a look. There's also internship programs, you know, all kinds of stuff that people might be interested in. Very good. And tell us once, once more, Heidi, how folks can donate directly to the center. Sure. If you'd like to help, you know, support our work, please go to sfieldcenter.org. There's a whole page, a donate button, all that. We'd appreciate it. Or if you'd just like to learn more, we have email lists, we have information. I just encourage you to come have a look. Or if, you know, you got specific questions, you can always reach out to me on the only Heidi at the Southern Poverty Law Center. <laughs> All right. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. We very much appreciate it. And very good luck to you and the center in the important work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You guys take care. Okay. Okay, Heidi. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bro, that was very, very informative. I, I think some of the points that Heidi brought out was the kind of stuff that our audience would be interested in learning about. Well, you know, uh, the NAACP used to be the uh, upfront organization for fighting uh, violence against blacks. But I must say the, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center has emerged as the most preeminent organization in the country that is on top of anti-black um, activities in this country and attacks on, on, other, on other people who are targets of, uh, of these kinds of feelings. So I would encourage folks who listen to this podcast to, um, to do some little research and find out more about these folks because they're doing a very, very important service to the country. Yeah, and you'll be interested uh, also in finding out where these hate groups are located. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, has a hate group map that... Um, that identifies the locations across the country. And circling back to the part of the conversation about the, uh, the display of the jars of earth um, at the uh, lynching memorial, I'm working with a group here in Miami because we know where 
one lynching took place in Dade County, which is down in um, South Dade County. So we um, went down and held a service about six months ago at this site um, and collected some of the soil, and we now have it at Barry University and mm-hmm. hope to one day be able to have it sent out to Montgomery to join the other displays of earth where lynchings took place. This program uh, uh, is one of my more enjoyable of the uh, programs that we have put on. I'm certainly uh, indebted to the Southern Property Law Center for uh, uh, lending Heidi to us. Okay. Okay, brother, that would be a wrap. It's a wrap. That brings the season to an end. It's been a good one, too. We've tried to put out information that people could pick up on and do their own research and follow exactly, up on these things. Exactly. So bringing these guests and, and, and raising these topics uh, in these in these podcasts are intended to stimulate intellectual interest and activity beyond just listening to the podcast. Exactly. We simply want to, to whet their appetite so that they'll go out and learn more about these things for themselves. Right. And this brings to an end this season. And stand by for another season of exciting topics on Through Black Eyes Unfiltered. I'm looking forward to it. I'm Dr. Raymond Dunn. And I'm Dr. Marvin Dunn. And we are the Dunn Dunn Brothers. Brothers. Hello, listeners, and thank you very much for being a part of our program. As a reminder, we discussed in Season 2, the Black Seminoles of Florida, slavery in Florida, lynching in Florida, historic black leaders of Miami, We're going to pick it up in our next season with an additional set of interesting topics. Are you an artist looking for a place to record high-quality vocals to meet a certain standard? Are you looking for a certified audio engineer that was trained to work in any recording environment and proficient in Pro Tools? Are you looking for sound design, music production, movie scores, or production for any multimedia project? What about learning how to produce and operate Pro Tools? All of these things can be accomplished by working with producer A.V. of Clockwork Track. Stay locked in to at Clockwork305 on IG for updates and further details. To set up a session, A.V. can be reached at 305-812-9292. Let Clockwork Track service all of your audio production needs. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Aris Crown All Natural Products and Clockwork Tracks for providing our podcast music. Special thanks also to our editor, Track 53, as well as HGAB Studios and MRD2 Media. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at TBE Unfiltered, or go to our website at tbeunfiltered.com. And when you do, don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. See you next week. Mm-hmm.